Hello students, this is a quick video to go over to May 9th or May 10th, depending upon your block, uh, genetics practice that we did in class um, to help you out. I enjoyed seeing you do this through a self-assessment model. So it's posted in classroom, right? So for like bio A, it's here, May 9th genetics practice for E and G, it'll be May 10th. Here were the questions and there were, um, eight genetic crosses for you to do a couple pedigrees for you to look at and go through. I did post an answer key and the answer key has, uh, my pictures from working out on the board. So let me kind of talk you through my thought processes on these problems. The first question asks you to cross a heterozygous tall plant with a heterozygous tall plant. What is the probability that the offspring will be tall or short? Hetero means different. So it means having different alleles. Remember that the principle of segregation says that one allele goes into each sex cell. So here, this big T would represent a sex cell. This little T would represent a sex cell. Those are called gametes. So imagine that these are sperm, these are eggs. These have one allele due to principle of segregation. When they come together, they make the baby or a zygote that can develop. And this one would be big T, big T. So two dominant alleles. This one would be big T, little t, so a dominant and a recessive allele. In this instance, the dominant allele will be expressed over the recessive allele. Both alleles are actually expressed, but the plant will come out tall. This one, big T, little t, so heterozygous, it will also be tall. Little t, little t, this plant will be short. So you will get 75% tall, 25% short. If you remember back to our lessons, this all starts with the P generation. That's pure breeding that Mendel worked with. The pure breeding uh, generation is homozygous. So it's going to be homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. They always come out tall. These ones always come out short. He bred them together and that gave him an F1 generation. If you did that Punnett square, where they all come out heterozygotes, big T, little t. And so this is crossing that F1 by the F1. So self-pollinating them and giving you the F2 generation. So this is representing the F2 generation. All right, that's called a monohybrid. The next question went into two traits at once, right? You're really 30,000 traits. For this, we're going to assume independent assortment. And that means that the uh, genes are located on different chromosomes or far apart enough on a chromosome that they sort independently of each other. So they don't rely on each other. They don't, they're not influenced by each other as they're made into sex cells. If you're interested in this, um, some genes that violate this or that would do um, travel together would be like red hair and freckles, right? They oftentimes when you see uh, people with red hair, they have freckles. So the way this works is we have two traits. So here we have a capital B and a lowercase b, a capital C and a lowercase c. So that this is the B gene that stands for black coat color or yellow coat color. The C stands for straight fur or curly fur. So this is an F1 by an F1 because we have heterozygote, heterozygote. So you might already remember from class that that's going to give you a nine to three to three to one ratio. But in a test, I'm going to ask you to do one of these. And I'm going to give you a hint if you're watching this video, it's not going to be a heterozygous by a heterozygote, right? Because then you would just know it's 9331. I'm going to ask you to do something different. So, and we did that in class. It's not like I'm asking you to do something you haven't done. So you foil it. You go first, outer, inner, last. These give you the possible gamete combinations. So this sex cell could have, from the principle of segregation, one dominant B, one dominant C. It could be a uh, dominant B, a recessive C or a lowercase C. It could be a small B or a recessive B and a dominant C. It could be two recessives. That's the same for each because um, both parents are double heterozygotes. So here's what it kind of came out to on the board. And when you cross them together, I got nine out of 16 come out with black and straight fur. Three out of 16 come out with black and curly fur. Three out of 16 come out with yellow and straight. And only one out of 16 comes out with the double recessive of yellow and curly. 
This is important. That's um, Mendelian genetics. And then uh, violations of that would be non-Mendelian, um, which is really interesting to learn about. The next question asked you, what's the probability of getting the baby being uh, heterozygous, big B, little b, big C, little c? So I'm asking you for the probability of a genotype. The way this works is you do the simple four box punnett square for each trait. So you keep the Bs together. So big B, little b, that comes from this individual. And then big B, little b from the second one, cross them. Big C, little c, big C, little c, cross them. So the probability that I am heterozygous, big B, little b, big B, little b, or dominant, recessive, dominant, recessive, is two out of four. Same thing here, two out of four. You can then use the product rule because I'm saying big B, little b, and big C, little c, that implies multiplication. So two-fourths times two-fourths, you multiply the numerators, two times two is equal to four, Multiply the denominators, four times four is equal to 16. Four over 16 is one fourth. All right, here, this uh, gave some students a little bit of trouble. Um, so let's go over it here. For blood types, you can either be A, AB, or O, and then a separate allele, you can either be positive RH factor or negative RH factor. So we use the capital letter I to denote the presence of the antigen on the red blood cell, the presence of the marker. This person has both A markers and B markers on their red blood cell. This would be an example of codominance for multiple alleles. Both are expressed. They have a baby with someone who is O blood. So that's little I, little I. That denotes the absence or the, that there is no antigen on the red blood cell. Here, for the rhesus factor, and this is what I um, tried to clarify in class, you're either positive, which means you have the antigen on the red blood cell. So here's your red blood cell, and you might have a positive rhesus factor, or you're negative, which just means the absence of it, which is similar to being O blood type. So in this instance, the positive is dominant to the negative, just like A is dominant to O and B is dominant to O as well, right? Because now let's imagine that this person is, let's say that this person is I, A, little i, and it is like positive and a negative. Well, they're going to express the A's. They'll also express the small i, but that small i is just the absence of an antigen, so it means nothing's there. And they'll express the positives. They'll also express the negatives, but the negatives mean that nothing's there as well. So this person is A positive. So the chance here that the baby was, what did I ask you for? Um, an A positive child. Well, the chance that they're A is two out of four. The chance that they're positive is two out of four. Two out of four times two out of four is equal to four over 16 or one fourth. All right, and then I ask you, well, what must be the child's genotype in problem three? So what is, the child is gonna be a heterozygous A and a heterozygous for the rhesus factor. Here's one that um, you know, you'd see maybe in AP biology, but if we have a lot of traits at once, right? And we're gonna assume independent assortment for these four traits. And I asked you, what are the odds of getting offspring with a recessive phenotype for all four traits? Well, I didn't pay enough attention making the problem, which is unfortunate. Um, you'll see why in just a second. So I do my A's by my A's. Okay, set out that Punnett square, one out of four. Do my B's by my B's. Do that Punnett square, two out of four um, are going to be the recessive phenotypes. Do my C's by my C's. Uh-oh, because this person was homozygous dominant, and this person's heterozygous, zero out of four come out recessive, uh, homozygous recessive. Here, you can do uh, the Ds as well. So rece a homozygous recessive by a heterozygous, you're going to get two out of four. One over four times two over four times zero over four times two over four is equals zero out of 16. So if I had done it differently and didn't have this as a homozygous dominant, you could have figured out the probability there. All right. So what have we done so far? We've done monohybrids, we've done dihybrids, we've done product rule for two traits at once, or more traits at once. 
Now let's get into some non-Mendelian genetics. So some items that uh, don't follow uh, what Mendel did with the pea plants. Here we've got the snapdragon plants. I showed you pictures of them in class. We're going to do a heterozygous snapdragon plant that is pink with a red snapdragon plant. I did it two ways. You could either do C denoting color and then um, a superscript showing red or white, um, or you could just done R and W's. And it shows you that they'll come out 50% red and 50% pink. So this is an example of what's called incomplete dominance, right? When you turn in incomplete work, nobody wins here. Neither um, allele is going to be uh, what we might say the winning one or fully expressed. They're expressed and it kind of comes out as a blend of them. Well, this is interesting because if you uh, breed pink by pink, right, you would get red, two pinks, and a white. And so it disproves the concept of genetic blending because the alleles come back out. Um, if we we're just a blend here with these snapdragons, um, then they would stay pink forever. Pink by pink would just be all pinks. Now you might say to me, Mr. Gidney, well, I am definitely a blend of my parents. And I say, I am too, right? Like I'm half Japanese and a uh, quarter English and quarter Irish. I get it. But what's really happening is that there's a lot of punnett squares contributing to my skin color. It's not just one, right? That's why we get a gradient. Things that have many punnett squares are called polygenic. And then you can get like a bell-shaped distribution of traits. All right. Um, so for example, for height, right? There's like 13 different pun and squares that contribute to height. And they're all, they can be different enzymes or different hormones or different things that contribute to it. Here, co-dominance. I told you like a couple, each person should be expressed. Here, this checkered chicken is going to be both black and white. My sister actually has one. I saw it in our, our Mother's Day Zoom call yesterday. Um, you cross uh, checkered by checkered, you get black, you get checkered, checkered, and white. So once again, um, it's disproving the concept of genetic blending. But in this instance, they're both expressed. Okay, this was pretty interesting right here with the um, X-linked recessive diseases. For example, hemophilia or color blindness or muscular dystrophy. So here, this female, and this is the most classic example, is a carrier, um, has a baby with a male who is not a carrier, does not exhibit the trait. The trick here is remember that Y does not carry the allele. The Y has many, many, many fewer genes than the X, and so it does not carry lots of the um, alleles that are on the X chromosome. So this is interesting, right? So you go, I do the sexes first, X, 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 Y, X, Y. This one's going to be uh, homozygous dominant. So no hemophilia. This one's going to be heterozygous. Still no hemophilia. This H is, uh, this dominant H is expressed enough, even with uh, bar body inactivation. If you remember our calico cat lesson, that the lady is not hemophiliac, but she's a carrier for it. And then here, this uh, boy, does not have hemophilia, has the dominant allele, and this one does. So if the child is a boy, then we're just looking at these two squares, there's a 50% chance that the child could have hemophilia. All right, so you should practice those. There are tons of practice problems in um, Google Classroom. Don't just rely on a study guide. All right, let's look at this pedigree. Um, here it skips a generation, so it's got to be recessive. Okay, it cannot be dominant. Um, if it's dominant, then it can't skip a generation. Now, here's a question. Could it be autosomal recessive or sex-linked? You can rule out sex-linked, but you can never rule out autosomal recessive completely. So for these types of problems, I want you to give me as much reasoning as you can, and I will give you credit. Here, when we're looking to see if something's sex-linked, we look at dads and daughters and moms and sons. So let's look at this daughter. If she has it, and if it is sex linked, like let's say hemophilia, her dad, which is 2-3, would have to have it because he gives her an X and it has to have that recessive allele. Since he does not have it, he this is not a sex linked trait. All right, this one would be autosomal recessive, which I put here. Let's check out this one. It's another one that skips generations, skips right here, skips right here. So this has got to be uh, recessive. 
Um, it looks like it's affecting males more often. Um, we don't have a ton of information here, so it could be sex linked. It could be autosomal recessive. We don't have um, enough evidence to make a big claim, uh, but it could be either one. Here, let's look at one for um, a dominant disease. Huntington's disease is very sad. Uh, famous uh, country singer had it. And so here, dominant cannot skip a generation. So let's see. Oh, it skips a generation right here, so it can't be this one. All right, that one's okay. And here it skips the generation. can't be this one. So let's see if this would work. Dominant would be like this. So since they have a child that doesn't have it, she would be heterozygous. This one's little h, little h. Yep, it works out. All right. Um, and then the last one was uh, mitochondrial inheritance. And this is just interesting, right? Your mitochondria comes from your mother. So the mother, um, if she has a mitochondrial disease, all of her children would have it. So notice how all of her children have it, but only her daughters would pass it on. Her son would not pass it on. So if this son was married, but didn't pass it on. So let's look at this one, passes it on. Son does not pass it on. Daughters pass it on. Son does not pass it on. So pretty interesting there. Um, and you should look at the, I showed you in class, the UMDF, the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. There's a lot of diseases that affect the mitochondria um, that need good researchers like you to work on them. All right, students. Um, we also did, you know, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings and how that Y chromosome is passed down. That'd be good to review as well. I just didn't fit it on the sheet. Hope you found this helpful. Take care. Peace out.